Good morning, everybody, and welcome into our holiday mailbag episode of Hog Hoops Live. I'm your host, Curtis Wilkerson. You can find me over at hogsports.com with Trey Biddy, Danny West, and Andrew Ellis. We're going to take just a few minutes to break down Wednesday's win over UNC Asheville. We're going to discuss Nick Smith, of course. But from there, I'm giving you guys the floor and spending the rest of the show answering questions from our listeners uh, just to get you geared up for the holidays. It should be a good one today, but that's actually up to you. So you got to bring the heat with some questions here. Should be fun. Let's go ahead and get started. All right. You know all the places by this point that you can watch or listen to the show. Be sure to throw us a like, a thumbs up, a five-star review. Those things really do help us quite a bit. Um, don't forget about our promo, right? Still time to be a part of that deal. Hogsports is 50% off right now for your annual VIP membership, and Paramount Plus is free with your subscription. Uh, the same deal that we've been talking about for the last couple weeks here. I think that runs through the new year. Uh, Hard to beat. Hard to beat what we got going on. Jump over to hogsports.com. Uh, no promo code, anything like that over there. Uh, you'll see the story on the front page. Click follow the instructions. You're good to go. I would encourage you, if you haven't already done so, to take advantage of that. All right. No point in burying the lead here, right? Star freshman Nick Smith Jr. Look, he missed the first six games of the season in right knee management. Made his return in late November. Looked to be really hitting his stride, but you know there were some bumps in the road. He came out of the game in the last five minutes in the win over Oklahoma and Tulsa. Precautionary, we're told. You know the Hogs had the game under control. No need to put him back in there late. He practiced the next week. Started against North Little or uh, starting against Bradley in North Little Rock. He's kind of limping there towards the end of the first half. He started the second half, but he misses the last 17 minutes of the game. We were told afterwards, uh, you know, that he had got a tape job that just wasn't really comfortable. At that point, the Hogs had a huge lead, uh, decided to rest him, and, and, you know, that it wasn't serious and he should be go, good to go for Wednesday. You know, the rumors started spreading like wildfire the next few days, uh, you know, regarding his status. I, I think you'd be amazed at some of the crazy things that I heard over the last, I don't know, 72 hours or so. But look, at any rate, get to Bud Walton Arena Wednesday night. Nick Smith is in street clothes. Or at least comes out about 20 minutes or so prior to tip off. Uh, the direct quote, it, it was short and sweet. Arkansas freshman guard Nick Smith Jr. will be out of the lineup indefinitely for right knee management. It's kind of like we were back to square one, right? So, uh, you know, that, that didn't come as particularly surprising to me um you know my personal stance on it has been if, if you've got a key player who has missed you know the end of the last two games for whatever reason uh why play him against a unc Asheville team that, that quite frankly you should destroy anyway when you have a week-long break after that before sec play which is a lot more important to follow uh, I, I think the issue here is some of the wording right that's what drives people nuts, a timetable of indefinite or, you know, a diagnosis or, or, or status or whatever you want to call it of right knee management. That doesn't sit well with a lot of folks. Why? Well, it's kind of vague, right? But that is 100% calculated and by design. It just is. It makes the job for a guy like me a lot more challenging because it leaves the door open for you know, folks to create more narratives that, that kind of run wild. It's kind of like the whisper game, you know, when a story changes just a bit with every person it, it gets passed along to, and before you know it, 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 it balloons up. Uh, whatever, that's human nature. That happens. That's part of the deal. Uh, let me start by saying this. I understand people's frustrations. I do. Nick Smith Jr. is a rare talent. Arkansas fans want to enjoy him while he's here. They certainly want more clarity, you know, as to why he's unavailable. There's nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with that. But I also completely understand the approach from a medical player and staff perspective. I mean, it was entirely unsurprising to me that Musk didn't come into the presser last night right away and say, hey, guys, Nick Smith will be back at X date. We were going to ask him, but that answer wasn't coming because it's not available. <laughs> or prudent to give one. You know, I've said this since the first go around with this situa situation, but it does Eric Musselman, 
uh, Arkansas or, or Nick, for that matter, zero good to put a target date or a timetable for a turn out there. And that's even more true now that this is happening a second time. Uh, how will he respond to rehab and treatment? How will he handle returning back to practice and activity? When is everyone you know, involved, comfortable and, and confident that he's going to be ready to get back out there? Uh, people are going to throw a bunch of different theories out there, but those are all questions that do not have clear answers. Calling it indefinite uh, is happening because it is indefinite, and it also takes pressure off Nick to meet some sort of deadline to get healthy. You don't want to put that on a kid. Keep in mind the Fardals AMAC, the Big Maple situation at Texas Tech. Right, he temporarily hit the portal in the middle of the season. One of the one of the reasons that was coming out was because, you know, he was he was injured, he was in a cast, and and you know they were putting a lot of, you know, dates and timetables on it. Oh, January first. Oh, the start of Big Twelve play. He'll be back. And he felt pressured. He felt like he was being rushed. Why would Arkansas do that? You know, as far as what what Nick's actual injury is, the, the harsh reality of it is that it's none of our business unless Nick wants it to be. I mean, we'd certainly like to know. It would help me as a reporter with a medical background to be able to provide some extra context. I'd love to be able to do that. But he's not obligated to disclose that, and, and Eric Musselman definitely isn't without the consent, consent and agreement from Nick and his family. You know, and I think that's probably why Muss was... You know, he looked like he was, he was visibly frustrated as we kind of kept prying him on it last night during the presser because there just isn't a lot to be said on his end other than, you know, Nick is out indefinitely right now. They want him to get fully healthy, and, and he'll start his rehab as best as he can. You know, there's a lot out there about is he going to shut it down and get ready for the draft? Is he going to get back and play? Uh, whose decision is this? Who's having him set out? All sorts of stuff. Uh, you know, but the final thing, and, and then we'll move on because I've, I've spent plenty of time on this already, but, um, you know, try to understand that this is a unique situation. Having this type of prospect, it's, uh, I mean, it's uncharted waters for Arkansas. There are a lot of cooks in the kitchen, which means there are a lot of different factors that have to be considered. And yeah, that, that includes both short and long-term goals and aspirations for this kid. But at the end of the day, uh, don't lose sight that, you know, everyone wants Nick to be healthy and successful. Everyone involved. And most importantly, you know, Nick Smith Jr. is a competitor. He's a special talent with a bright future. He's got a ton on his shoulders for, for a young man of his age. Uh, but as his core, you know, don't forget that he just wants to be able to play and, and compete in the game he loves. You know, so I, I hope that we see Nick out there again real soon. But above all, you know, I, I just want the kid to be healthy uh, and happy. So it's, it's an unfortunate situation right now. It's frustrating, but it's, it's delicate. It's, it's touch and go, and, and that's probably just the way it's going to be for a little while. All right. Basketball. You want to talk about a trap game? Look, the, the SEC has been getting absolutely bludgeoned lately. You know, Bama, uh, Tennessee, Auburn even, they all, they all lost to good teams, but they, the league kind of takes a hit when that happens, when some of your better teams are losing to, to other good teams. When you do a league-by-league league comparison, and that stuff does matter when it comes to who gets the extra bid for the NCAA tournament. But, man, some of this. South Carolina loses to East Carolina. Mississippi State loses to Drake. Ole Miss loses to North Alabama. Texas A&M loses to Wofford. And what the hell are we doing, people? Tough scene for the SEC, no doubt about it, recently. Uh, you know, and so Arkansas is already down Trevin Brazil. Then you lose Nick Smith on top of it. You're playing this pre-Christmas, pre-SEC, mid-major game uh, against an opponent, you know, that has a star player. They're averaging over 80 points per game. Uh, you know, all while your league is kind of getting taken to the woodshed, the recipe was there, I guess is what I'm saying, but Arkansas wasn't having it, man. I mean, it was a, that was a blowout uh, from start to finish. Arkansas barely broke a sweat, beat UNC Asheville 85-51. to 51. Um, You know, this, in my opinion, was an underrated win because 
I mean, it's another example of how this team just dials in and goes about its business regardless of, of who they play or who's available. It's been really impressive. Started on the defensive end again. You know, UNC Asheville, they were averaging 81 points per game coming in. They got held to 51. They're shooting 40% from three, nine, uh, nine made threes per game. They barely got nine attempts off. They were two of 12 from three-point range. Arkansas locked down the perimeter. Drew Pember was that star. I mean, this is a, a guy who was at Tennessee for a couple years. He transferred, and he's really blossomed, um, averaging a double-double. He's a defensive player of the year in that league. Uh, he scores five points on one of seven shooting. He only gets four rebounds. Um, absolutely got put in the blender. I mean, they were he's a defensive player of the year in his league now, and Arkansas was going at him, attacking him. 15 more steals, 20 more for, uh, forced turnovers. I think they converted that into, what, 32 points on the other end. It's a pretty, pretty solid defensive clinic for Arkansas, who ranks eighth in the country in adjusted defensive efficiency now. That's your calling card. You know, and then on the offensive end, it, it was, you know, who's going to score now and, and fill the void with Nick out? Um, you know, I think this game kind of showed that Arkansas, you know, we know that they're a deep team, but maybe they're even deeper than we thought. I mean, it's a one-game sample size. We'll see, right? You got to keep that in mind, but you got to be impressed with what you saw. You know, Devo's inserted into the starting lineup. I thought he was tremendous. I thought Devo was really good, you know, aside from a couple of his classic just kind of ill-advised flashy passes that became turnovers. I mean, he really played within himself offensively. Um, he had good shot selection, knocked down the three, had a couple transition finishes. He had some great passes. He had one where he, he shot faked a three-pointer at the top of the key. It sent a defender flying. He zipped a pass to, to Ricky Council, who was cutting baseline. It was a really, really high-level play. Um, had, a, had a nice just kind of over-the-head, one-hand assist is kind of over the top of a defender uh, Makai Mitchell catches on the roll for a finish I thought Devo looked good but uh, you know it was kind of about the bench mob wasn't it you know Arkansas starting power forward Jordan Wall she goes out he's got you know two fouls in the first four minutes of the game and well here comes Jalen Graham looking like an all-american I mean what is it with this guy it, it's crazy the spurts that he has Opinion said after the game, he looked like Hakeem Olajuwon out there. Graham absolutely destroyed Drew Pember, a guy that I said a minute ago is a, a good defender. Uh, and it wasn't just him. It was anybody who tried to guard him, you know, back to the basket, uh, face up, attacking from the perimeter. He, you know, Graham was aggressive, but he was under control. Uh, it was a footwork clinic, a, a spin move <laughs> clinic in there. He led the charge with 16 points. I thought he did some pretty good things on the defensive end of the floor, too. He took a charge, um, had a steal. You know, I'm telling you, Arkansas is going to need another big guy to carve out a role. And, you know, we, we all see how talented and skilled that Jay, you know, Jalen Graham is, how good he can be. But, you know, can he stack games? Can he do this on the road in a tight one against LSU? And we'll, we'll see. But... Man, he was great on Wednesday. That's encourage, an encouraging sign going into the holidays. Anthony Black comes out early in the first half with two fouls. So you're already down two guys, and you got you know two starters who get two fouls early. So you got to go deeper into your bench. You know, I I thought Darian Ford uh, did a really good job coming in, playing tough defense, keeping things under control offensively. But it was Joseph Pinion who really came in and blew it up, right? I mean, he looked great. Two corner threes. Two fast break donks. He's bouncy now. Don't don't be fooled. I thought he made a couple really unselfish plays too for assists. You know he had another open look in the corner for three. Uh, you know it's it's kind of like pass, passing up a good shot to create a great one. You know made the extra pass to Anthony Black. He knocks down a three. Um, he could have scored. You know got an, another layup or dunk in transition, but instead he lobbed one up to Jalen Graham, uh, who skied up for the dunk that, that might have been the highlight of the game he fought hard defensively 10 points for joseph pinion you know most importantly he plays 19 meaningful minutes and had success so you know that experience for him is so valuable as is the confidence that comes with it so you feel a little bit better now about him holding his own if his numbers called again moving forward he needed that opportunity he took advantage of it i think it says a lot about him too uh you know the work that he's putting in behind closed doors, 
uh, and just his mental makeup of staying ready and staying focused. Really impressed with Pena. I thought he did a great job. I thought Kamani Johnson was an absolute menace. You know, he just throws bodies around. He gets his body thrown around. He gobbles up everything around the rim. That, it was fun to watch. Makai was solid, four or five from the field. But, you know, he does other things that he doesn't get enough credit for. Three assists, three more steals, two blocks. Getting that out of your center, that, that that's good stuff. Mikel got in there. He made some mistakes, you know, moving screen, uh, missed a dunk. But, hey, six points, three boards, three blocks in seven minutes, that'll play. So I, I like what we saw from the front court. I like that Black, you know, Walsh and Council were able to get off their feet a little bit. Nobody played more than 28 minutes in this game. Ten guys scored, eight guys scored at least six points. So, you know, just a really solid win to take into the holidays. Momentum, you know. I asked Eric Musselman after the game how he feels just, just kind of turning the page on this segment of the season uh, and getting ready for league play. And, I mean, he's clearly pleased. Arkansas is 11-1. and one. They're three points away from being undefeated. They, they played a tougher schedule than they did last year. Uh, they've shown some resolve. They've grown up. And resume-wise, they're in great shape. They really are. Number 11 in the net rankings as of, what is today, Thursday morning. Uh, right now, with, you know, no more, I think the key here is there's no more real opportunities for catastrophic losses like you had last year with Hofstra, right? You know, the, the bad teams that you play are still SEC teams, and, and most of those games come on the road where it wouldn't hurt you as bad if you slipped up anyway. So from that perspective, they're in a real good spot. 10th in the AP poll, 10th at Ken Palm, uh, 12th at Torvik, 10th at Sagarin, 6th in the BPI. All these metrics that people look at, Arkansas is in great shape. So going into Christmas, you know, given everything this team's been through, you know, the expectations were high, but you wondered about growing pains with, with all the new faces and the young guys. You add in the adversity that they faced – you lose Trevin Brazil for the year. You've been without Nick Smith more than you've had him. Uh, and to be where Arkansas is, I mean, it's a hell of a job, honestly, by, by these guys and the coaching staff. But now it gets real, right, SEC play. Okay, moving on. Mailbag time, like I said. Uh, let's start over on the Razor's Edge message board, and, and then we'll work our way over to the chat. But the rest of the episode, we're going, we're going Q&A, rapid fire. So let's see what you got. All right. Runway 3886 asked, uh, yesterday's lineups, best five versus last year's best five, who you taking? Wow. You're just going to start this thing off with that type of heat, huh? Damn, that, that's a great question. Okay. So that would be uh, Black, Devo, Council, Walsh, and Mackay. Those are your starters. Although... I guess the best five last night probably inclu included Graham and Pinion. Uh, but that five versus J.D. Note, Aldis Tony, uh, Stanley Amude, Trey Wade, and Jalen Williams. Man, whoo, that's a good question. That's a burner to start with. I should have screened these better. Uh, you know, so with Nick or Trevin, I, I take this current group hands down. Still, though, given last night's look... I like the current backcourt more than last year's. I love J.D. Note. He's my guy. Everybody knows that. Uh, but I, I think there's more creation, uh, you know, that this backcourt's a little bit more dynamic. So I, I'll take that. Um, Jalen Williams over, over Makai, I think. Oh, man. Um, give me the current group. Give me last night's five. More offensive balance. They're equally disruptive on the defensive end. But that's a close one. I bet if you played 10 times, it would be 6-4. to four. The group last year was nasty defensively. Great question to start. Okay, moving on. Jacob D. Gar says, I know injuries and early foul trouble played a major role in seeing different guys out there last night. That said, do you think Musk may trust his bench more than he has in previous seasons? Fair question. Um, you know, obviously, I think part of that depends on Nick's availability. Um, I think he, I think Muss is going to have to inside. If the backcourt is healthy, you know, Nick, Anthony Black, Ricky Council, Devo Davis are, are going to grab most of the minutes there. Uh, Jordan Walsh playing some at the three. If Arkansas goes bigger, uh, you know, with 
with Nick out, um, you know, I still think the others gobble up most of that clock, but you know, we see what happens with, with foul trouble, you know, like last night. So that could extend it a little bit, uh, in the front court though, I think Makai is going to be uh, a constant, but it doesn't seem like he's going to be, you know, suddenly like a 30 minute per game guy. At least we haven't seen that yet. So there's, there's going to be room there for guys to, to fill in. Um, and they're going to have to go bigger at some points, I, I think with Walsh. At the, at the four, you know, there might be some matchups where they need to get a, you know, a, a bigger, more physical body in there. So uh, Kamani's great in spurts, but I, I'm i doubling down, though, that I think this team needs Graham or Mikel to give them some good minutes on a nightly basis. I think that needs to happen. All right. Pit Daddy says, could you explain the net rankings process to me like I'm five? I don't understand that deal one bit. Oh, man. Well, they, they try to make it easy for you with the quadrants, the way they break it down, you know, quad one, two, three, and four. That's kind of how they qualify your strength of schedule. Uh, the toughest games are quad one and then quad two, and then the not so tough are three and four. Uh, they take into account, you know, who you're playing, where you're playing, and everything like that. So uh, basically, schedule tough. Uh, don't be afraid to go on the road. Probably like losing close to a good team is not as damaging as winning ugly against a bad team. Think about that. You know, like Arkansas lost to Creighton by three. Um, I don't think that that probably didn't hurt them much at all. They struggled against UNC Greensboro and, and won that game, you know, maybe by a lot less than they were expected to. They dropped like 10 spots in the net. So, um, you know, the more high-quality opponents, the better, but beating the bad teams while playing efficiently uh, can also give you a boost. They have math for that that nuclear physicists can't understand, and, and neither can I, so that, that was my best shot there. Okay. King Flameshot says, off topic, but what do you want for Christmas, Curtis? Man. Um, honestly, and I mean this sincerely, I, I just... I really just want to enjoy the day with with my wife and family. You know, I don't I don't need gifts or, or anything at this point in my life. I, I just want a peaceful, you know, drama free kind of day where I can just put my phone down without having to worry about, you know, what I'll find when I pick it back up. My mind is tired. I, I miss being present, you know, for things like that. I'm a simple man. So, you know, something like that, just a, a nice, peaceful day. Uh to enjoy with the people I care about. That that's all I need. Port Ice Hog wants to know uh, about the rotation of bigs and SEC play and how it might change game to game. Yeah, we hit on that just a little bit. Uh, I, I think I think you do raise a good point. And, you know, like I said, Makai is going to be your constant. I think his, his game fits against any opponent. I think he's that level of versatile. Uh, you know, like we said, Walsh is going to play the power forward spot until a team forces them out of it with matchups. Um, I love Kamani again. I think I said this on the last episode. Like I, I feel like it comes across that, that I, or some people are just, you know, like looking for a way to replace him. It's not the case at all. Uh, that's not the case at all. I, I love what he brings to the table. His edge, his toughness is great. He knows what he's doing out there. Um, his energy is contagious for the team. I, I need to see him do what he's doing right now against, you know, SEC size and athleticism consistently. There are games he, he's done it in the SEC in the past, but you know against against some of the big dogs, uh, where you need to pull off, you know, a major win. Uh, does what he do? Does what he do? Does what he does? I got tongue twisted there. But does it translate right into those type of games? You know, I think he's going to have a role, uh, but I don't know if it'll be nightly or or how much, and and it might be. Uh, kind of like you alluded to, a game-by-game -game type of deal. And that's why I think it's so critical for Graham or Mikel to step up. I, I think you might need them both. To your point, like, you know, if you need offense on a given night, uh, Graham could be your guy. If you need a bigger body, uh, a rim protector, uh, and some toughness, uh, well, you know, then Mikel it is. I think the key, though, is for both of those guys to stay ready and bring it when their name is called on. You know, it's tough when uh, maybe your role is not as consistent as you want it to be for you to be consistent when you get called on, uh, but that's the challenge. 
Um, I think that's just kind of the way it's going to be there. But they need that, and that's why I thought last night was so important because you got good, you, well, you got great stuff out of Jalen Graham, um, and I, I thought the flashes you saw from Mikel, uh, getting him out there for a few minutes, work through some mistakes, and, and make an impact, that was good to see. Navy John 79 says, uh, Ron Holland, what is the chance he flips to us? Also, the Boozer twins, any chance there? Yeah, so, uh, you know, we're still in wait and see mode with Ron Holland. Obviously, committed and signed at Texas. Uh, the Chris Beard situation is fluid and just wild. Uh, but, you know, what we're monitoring right now is whether or not Ron asks for a release from his letter of intent at Texas. Uh, that, that's the first thing that would have to happen there. You know, it's, it's been quiet on that front. Um, I do have some folks that I trust that believe that will ultimately happen. Um, you know, at the same time, his mom posted like 100 Texas things on her Instagram last night. So we'll see. But, but if it does, you know, I think you're looking at Arkansas as the top college option there. Why not? I mean, they were the runner-up. It was a close race. Um, it, it's logical to feel that way. I'm sure Arkansas would welcome him with open arms. Uh, and like I've said in the past, I, I think keep an eye, you know, maybe on that G League route as well. Oh, and then with the, the Boozer twins, yeah, so, man, uh, 2025 prospects who are just incredible talents, like generational type talents, I think. I mean, these guys are really good. Uh, Arkansas offered both those guys a few weeks ago. You know, a lot of people tend to think, you know, Duke, uh, because of Carlos Boozer, obviously, or, or the pro route, because, you know, they're that good. It's early, obviously. I mean, these guys are sophomores. But, yeah, I, I have every reason to believe there's mutual interest there, very real mutual interest there. Um, and I think we could see a visit lined up down the road. And, you know, So if that happens um, and Arkansas continues to build its brand the way that it has, why wouldn't they be in the mix? West Fort Pork says, uh, when do you think people will start waking up to the fact uh, that I was correct all along about Jalen Graham and Joseph Pinion? Uh, do you think it's similar to last year when I was right about Trey Wade? <laughs> you are the prophet on such things, my friend. Hey, at, at the very least, man, give me one of those guys emerging over the, the course of the next couple months consistently. But they both looked great last night, and that was, that was big for your brand. Razorback R says, as we are about to get into the meat of the schedule, SEC, uh, how, do you think, how deep do you think Musk goes with his rotation? Kind of touched on that already, uh, but you know I think eight is is probably a good number there, a, a fairly consistent eight. Uh, but again, it you know it'll, it'll depend on you know Nick's status and you know, and when you have him back in there. Um, obviously, that changes things, right? Because it you know if, if he's a hundred percent and and good to go, that's that's thirty five minutes a game right there. It just come off the board, um, and that comes at you know the expense of somebody else. That's just the way it is. Um, if he's not there, you know, I, I don't think that you have a guy that you just throw in there and, and plug 35 minutes for. It would be spread out a little bit more, so I think it would be more expanded. Runway 3886 says, uh, could you talk more about the two top 20 recruits at the game yesterday? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Uh, well, first of all, Layden Blocker and his brother Landron were there. It was really cool. You know, Layden signed, so... Uh, they can recognize him. They did that, you know, on the on the video screen in Bud Walton Arena. Uh, he got a huge ovation. It was really cool. Um, I know that was a special moment for him. I remember when they did that uh, for Jordan Walsh in one of the games he came to after he signed last year. I think it was the Mississippi State game last year. And uh, I know that was cool for him. So, uh, you know, to see them do that for Layden, I thought was awesome. But, uh, yeah, a couple 2025 guys there as well. We're talking about all these 2025s. You know, Muss is getting started on them early. Uh, but I tweeted out a pic uh, of these two guys with Musk before the game. So uh, you have Nigel Walls. He's a, a big fella out of Houston, uh, tall, long, and lanky. He's 6'10", about 185 pounds right now. Young guy. He'll, he'll put some weight on. Uh, we don't have him ranked yet at 24-7 at sports, but, you know, as you alluded to, he's uh, pretty highly regarded in some other places. Obviously, you know, Texas is a, a pipeline state at the moment for Arkansas, so – uh, no surprise that they're on a, a kid from Houston there. Uh, the Hogs offered him last night, by the way, so uh, certainly some interest there. The other was uh, Jasper Johnson, this is a, a 6'2 combo guard uh, from Kentucky. Uh, so interesting prospect. He's got offers from uh, Xavier, Memphis, 
Cincinnati, I know for sure, maybe some others. Um, we do have a ranking on him right now at 24-7. He's a, he's a four-star prospect. I think he's number 33 uh, overall. So, yeah, a couple nice players that they, that they snuck in there uh, for the game last night. Last one here from Runway is, why do you think this team is more resilient uh, than teams we've had in the past? Uh, they seem to all genuinely want each other to ball out. You know, that's the most impressive part about this group for me. I mean, all these new faces, transfers who, you know, came in expecting big roles. you got high-end freshmen uh, who are on draft boards. But, man, they've all bought into the name on the front of the jersey as opposed to the back. And, hey, kudos to them and the staff for that. Look, Arkansas is good, and they know they are, and they really do play for each other. Uh, so far, it's just been a solid recipe. I think it helps when you've got good guys in the room right um good guys solid personalities you know for all the reasons i mentioned a few seconds ago like they're it's surprising there's not more ego than there is you know on this team and and you know me ball and hero ball but you're not seeing that with this group uh, and I, I think that's a testament of good leadership from the top down and a bunch of guys that understand they're capable of doing something special uh, if they stay together, and, and so far so good, adversity is going to hit again at some point. You know, I, maybe I'm crazy, but I think Arkansas is going to lose a game <laughs> again at some point. Uh, the SEC is tough; it's a gauntlet. You're traveling, you're going on the road. It's a grind with two games a week against good competition. Um, when that happens, how do they respond? So far, you've got every reason to believe that they'll respond well. Razor Al has a two-parter for us. Uh, do you believe? Layden Blocker can develop enough of a three-point shot to keep defenders honest from deep in college. Um, yeah, I do. I really do. You know, I don't, I don't expect Lay to be, you know, a high-volume guy. Um, but I could absolutely see him, you know, being a perimeter threat similar to Anthony Black. You know, teams are probably going to dare him early to shoot it. Uh, but I think he's good enough from out there when he's got his feet set to make him pay for that. Uh, and, and, you know, think twice about sagging off or going under screens and things like that. And, and if he does, uh, you'll start to see, you know, it, it kind of pay dividends uh, like it has for Anthony Black. Or it just kind of opens things up for him a little bit more. And the second part was, does Ricky Council's athleticism uh, potentially make NBA scouts pause and consider him as a top 15 pick? You know, Ricky's been incredible. He's really gone from a fringe guy. Um, you know, an intriguing prospect to, to someone I think is a surefire draft pick. Um, top 15, that might be a stretch right now, but, I, I mean, you know, if he carries over what he's been doing through the entire SEC slate, he's got to have some real first-round buzz, right? I mean, he, I think he's still leading the conference in scoring, unless that changed last night, but... Yeah, I mean, if he carries that over, he's going to be first team all league. He's looking at potential SEC player of the year. Uh, he's got NBA athleticism. He's got good size and length. Um, so, yeah, I, I think, you know, some people would start looking at him in that first round range. Obviously, uh, and he does need to tighten up the handle a little bit. It's interesting. He's a great isolation player, but, uh, man, he really pounds that thing, and, and sometimes he'll lose control of it. So, so he's got to tighten that up some. He's, he's getting better as a defender, but there's room for growth there. Uh, and then obviously the shot, you know, it's unorthodox. Uh, he's shooting at an okay clip, a little over 30%. Um, but I think he would need some improvement there. But, um, yeah, man, he's done wonders for his stock since he got to Arkansas. Really one of the, the better stories of the season. I don't think he's talked about enough. Young Sea Lion says, non-basketball related question, uh, but what are y'all doing for your little ones for his Christmas? Uh, this is my kids first as well, and my, my girlfriend has officially lost her mind. Well, it, it's our first Christmas as newlyweds, all right, for me and my wife, but no little ones for us yet, unless that news is like some kind of surprise Christmas gift that I'm, that I'm not ready for. So, uh, you know, the closest thing we have to a child right now is a, a wiener dog who's asleep um, on the floor beside me here. But, man, congrats to you. That That's awesome. Uh, that's going to be special. You know, my advice would be take a, a ton of, of pictures and video to capture those moments uh, and, and also do whatever your girlfriend says. That's a good way to have a, to have a happy Christmas. 
C. Lodney says, uh, does Muss's statement, uh, Nick looked forward to playing for the Razorbacks, bother you as much as it does me? Yeah, I, I definitely caught the past tense in that statement. Um, it caught my attention right away. I do think if you listen to the entire remark in its context, though, it doesn't come off as, as maybe alarming as it as it could have. Basically saying, you know, you know, Nick was looking forward to getting out there and competing for the Hogs, but he's been in and out. It hasn't gone as expected, you know, and they just want to get him healthy. So I know anytime somebody's injured and you, and you hear someone speaking in the past tense, you're like, whoa, now, what does that mean? But I, I don't, I really don't think that was the intent. But yeah, I notice it for sure. <laughs> also asked about uh, Jordan Walsh bringing the ball up the floor uh, when there wasn't a true point guard out there some last night, and if we might see that uh, similar situation moving forward seems a little risky. Um, yeah, I mean, I think I think Jordan Walsh has made some strides with his confidence and his control as a ball handler. You know, if it's on the break uh, with numbers or, or you know, kind of ripping and driving on a big man, great. Uh, you know, if, if, if Arkansas is relying on him right now to, to break a press or initiate things offensively, eh, maybe not so much, but he's getting there. Okay, let's move over to the chat here, rep some of these out. I've been, sometimes when I, when I get over here and start scrolling, I lose my, uh, I lose my place. So I'm going to get to as many of these as I can. If I skip over one, I, I'm sorry. Uh, that's not my intention. All right. Let's see. Cody L. James says, we can definitely still make uh, the national championship. I would hope so. I mean, it, you know, it, it's just crazy. This team keeps battling through adversity. You know, every time they have an obstacle that they face where you're like, oh, yeah, this is going to be where they hit the downswing or, oh, this is going to be a big problem. They, they just respond. Um, Arkansas needs – well, they, they needed everybody. I mean, if they had their full roster, this is 100% a national championship contender. Uh, they need Nick. They do. Um, it doesn't mean that, that the season is doomed, you know, for, while he's out or, you know, if, if he doesn't come back or whatever. Um, but, but you need that kind of guy. That's the kind of player that, that you know, helps win – national championship games he's he's the kind of guy that can put a team on his back uh when the rest of them don't have it and win a game but i think the good news is arkansas is showing that they might have some other guys capable of doing that alongside him you know ricky council has been incredible and and you got to think guys like anthony black jordan walsh are going to continue to progress and get better as the season moves forward so uh they've got a lot of pieces there and you know i i think you know whereas before I'm more speaking towards Brazil. You know, I, I just felt like Arkansas could match up with anyone, you know, no matter the style, the size, you know, however an opponent played because he was such a unicorn uh, and you could do so many different things with him. And, and just now I think it's more about the matchups once you get there. Get a good draw, sure. Um, and I think Arkansas is capable of competing and beating anybody, but I just think that stuff matters a little bit more now than maybe it did uh, before the injury bug hit. Uh, let's see. Cody L. James also said, "Grateful Musk got us back to this level." Yeah, it's a good problem to have. You know, it, it it's just such a proud program, and you know, it it just felt like for the longest that you know Razorback fans were just itching, man. They're just looking for a reason um, to erupt to kind of recapture some of that tradition and history. Um, yeah, I thought it was going to be Mike that got him there. And he did a good job, don't get me wrong. Um, but, man, Muss is just taking it to a different level. And I've said it a, a hundred times, and I'll probably say it a hundred more. I just don't think there's a better marriage between coach and fan base than Eric Musselman and the Arkansas fans. Equally crazy, equally intense, and equally energetic. Feed off of each other. Uh, but I, I think that's really cool to see. And, yeah, I mean, Arkansas is in a place right now where – they're becoming a you know a household name again, um, and that's cool because I think that's where this program belongs. And, and I think as long as he's around, uh, there's no reason why it won't stay that way. With with you know as as good of a coach he is, you know he's such a good recruiter. 
you know, with the way he can assemble these teams and flip rosters, I think it goes on notice how good of a coach he actually is when it comes to adjustments and, and X's and O's uh, and, and, you know, just putting his players in positions to succeed and, and maximize their talents. He's really, really good from a, from a basketball nerd perspective like myself. Um, it's just really fun to watch him coach a game. So, yeah, he's, he's really been incredible. Steve Miller says, I think Pinion brings exactly what they need, perimeter offense. Yeah, um, Arkansas is going to need to hit some threes. And, and yeah, I know they, they, they're 11 and 1 right now, and they put a decent schedule without it. Uh, I, I don't want to speak in absolute here. I don't think you're going to, uh, you know, double SEC teams up in the paint every game. I don't know that you can rely on uh, turning SEC teams teams over 20 25 times per game and getting 30 points in transition uh, maybe but you know I think at some point Arkansas is going to have to be able to soften up some defenses and knock down some threes uh, they're okay I mean they're better than they were percentage wise last year uh, but the volume hasn't been there and, and I think you know again uh, this is like the ultimate caveat here right but you know like with Nick I think you've got some volume there. He, he's a guy who can knock down volume threes. And then you have the others like Jordan Walsh, like Anthony Black, you know, Council, whoever, um, who knock them down, you know, lower volume, but at a pretty good percentage. And that's a good recipe to have. Um, you know, while Nick is, is unavailable or when he's not out there, uh, it would be nice to have some volume from somewhere else. And Joseph Pinion is definitely a guy uh, who can provide that. So, you know, if he's playing like he did last night, uh, and he's holding his own on the defensive end, and he's sharing the ball, and he's you know he's he's getting to his spots and getting looks. You know if you can fit him in there for for spot minutes and and rotations, and he can knock down a couple for you, that's huge. It's amazing the difference that two three pointers over the course of a game can make. Uh, George Ulmer says, Curtis, I'm going to put you on the spot. Without TB and without Nick, do we have any chance to win the national championship? Uh, I think no, but I hear too many fans who think uh, we not only can but should. Yeah, like you know, like I said, um, I think fully healthy that this squad was probably one of the top four or five teams in the country who had who had the best chance of doing so. Um, you know, would I ever completely rule out Eric Musselman and, and you know a, a team that is as talented as this from doing it? No, uh, but not that I ever expect it. But but my expectations for that happening that absolutely go down. Um, just really be about matchups, and you're gonna have to find some luck along the way anyway uh, in the NCAA tournament. But yeah, it, it definitely complicates matters a lot. Um, but you know, if you know if Arkansas were to go into the NCAA tournament without either one of those guys. I still think they're good enough to be a second weekend team. And then again, once you get there, all bets are off. But would, you know, would they be one of my betting favorites? Nah, probably not. Josh Wilbank says it's still not the 40 minutes of hell. You know, maybe not, but it's fun, though. It's fun. It's exciting. Brian Cogbill says I'd rather not have uh, the one and done players, no matter how good they are. Give me good players who are not one and done first rounders but good nonetheless especially if they're being saved uh, for the draft that would just keep attracting players uh, who use college to play some for one year and then go to the NBA and said I would prefer three and four year players uh, that we can get to know a bit uh, that can gel and develop and grow yeah you know I I like the idea of roster continuity and, and having returners uh, you know you just kind of know what you should expect and you know maybe you can avoid some of those downswings and the growing pains and everything like that now, the only problem with that is times are a changing, right? You know, like like college basketball is a different world now with the transfer portal era and NIL, that combination. Um, there are very few guys that are going to go to a school their freshman year and graduate from that same school, play four years. Uh, it's just the way it is because they're not getting opportunities early. They're going to try to go somewhere where they can. Um I'm not crazy about it as a former coach at the NAI level who didn't have to deal with that stuff. Um, but that's just the reality of where we're at. So I think you have to look at it and go, you know, how do I assemble my roster to have the best chance to win a lot of games in the year right in front of me? 
um, because you can't count on, you know, oh, we're going to, we're going to develop this guy and in two or three years, he's going to be really good. If that's the case, awesome. Uh, but if they're not getting their opportunities right away, a lot of them are going to, you know, they're going to test those waters and see if there's better opportunities elsewhere. So, um, you know, from that standpoint, I think you just got to be as talented as possible. And, uh, you know, with the, with the, the high school guys, I, I kind of like the approach that Muss has right now. They know that they can recruit at a high, high level. And so they're only recruiting high, high level high school guys. I, I don't think they're going to take any reaches or, or gambles or, you know, projects or anything like that anymore. I, I just don't see that happening. They're going to get elite level high school prospects who they think can contribute right away to a really good team. Um, and they're going to go out in the transfer portal and get experienced, proven players. Um, and then they're probably going to flip the, the roster after every year. Uh, maybe not 11 guys or whatever it was this season. It felt a little extreme, but hey, you know, we, we've seen a lot of turnover with Muss. I think he prefers that. He likes to wipe uh, the slate clean and, and kind of start with a blank canvas, and he, he's found success doing that. But no, I, I do understand where you're coming from. I just think, you know, with, with where the college basketball game is headed now, it's just hard to operate that way successfully. If you can keep guys like that, then, you know, great. Josh Wilbanks says slam dunk contest going on. Yeah, Arkansas has got some high flyers. That is awesome. I, I you know I got frustrated the last couple of years because they didn't have that many donkers. You know, like Stanley Mude, obviously. You know, Audis Tony. Those guys could they could do it. But this team is different, man. Like you know, Ricky Council will rise up and hammer it on you in traffic. Uh, he doesn't care. Brazil was obviously the same way, but you know. All these guys, Walsh Graham, Anthony Black, you, you know, your 6'7 point guard. Uh, those guys play above the rim. It's fun. Lobs, you know, transition. That's what gets butts in the seats. Let's see. Zach Van says, if Nick isn't 100%, they shouldn't play him. Uh, there's still a lot of talent on this team, minus Smith and Brazil. While losing them is tough, there's still... Uh, more talent remaining on this roster than we've had the last three years. I trust must to optimize the performance out of the remaining talent. And yeah, they're still talented. They're still talented for sure. Um, man, those are just two two really good players to lose. <laughs> so, uh, but no, I, I do agree that you know if, if somebody's not a hundred percent, it's tough. There are certain things you know nobody's a hundred percent. You know, once you get to the stretch of the season, but it, but if someone's injured, um, you know, there are certain things that you can, you know, probably play through and, and gut out. But, you know, for a basketball player, a lower body deal of, of any type, it just impacts you so much defensively, you know, your explosion, ability to move laterally, ability to get off the floor. Um, you know, so I, I, I agree from that standpoint. And then also, um, again, it's just a special prospect, you know, and, and there's a lot of things to consider there with him. You know, like I said earlier, uh, short and long-term goals. And, you know, I, I think Arkansas is the best version of themselves, uh, no doubt, with, with Nick Smith on the floor. But I agree, um, you know, for him, first of all, but, but then also for the, you know, the best situation for the team, get him 100% healthy uh, if you can. That way it's not a lingering deal uh, moving forward. George Homer says, Curtis, has anyone ever called you C-Dub? Oh, yeah. Most people do, actually. <laughs> Steve Miller says, Darian Ford played quality minutes. He needs more playing time. He did play well. It was good to see him get out there and do that. You know, he didn't try to, f well, okay. He did try to force the issue late in the game, but, you know, Arkansas is up by 30 points. He needs to get on the board, right? But, you know, I, I think those minutes in the first half were more important uh, for Darian to get in there. It shows a little bit of trust from the coaching staff, to, you know, to put him in, in a game early like that when there's some foul trouble. Uh, I thought he just played within his role. Um, you know, he, he didn't look, you know, nervous out there or anything. He didn't make a bunch of mistakes. No, he, he played tough and physical on the defensive end, uh, took care of the ball and, and kept things rolling. I, I thought he looked good. Man, George says, C-Dub, your wife said it was okay, so it's official now. Yeah, yeah, it's official. I can go by, I can go by C-Dub. That works for me. A lot of my friends call me that, so. 
And George says, C dub, the hardest part of being married and and then can we expect to see and when can we expect to see dub junior see you know if, if i know now that my wife is watching um you know i got to be careful about the way i answer these questions if you're subscribed at hogsports.com send me a send me a private message um you know we'll talk about it she won't know it'll kind of be our little secret so sorry hon josh wilbank says do you think this year's team could beat the 94 and 95 champs man <laughs> Uh, ooh. it's just so hard to say because it's, it's just two completely different eras of basketball. Um, I do think at full strength, they'd have a good chance, but I, I'd have a hard, I don't know. I'd have a hard time picking them over the champs. If, if Arkansas wins the, you know, the 22, 23 national championship, and I'm willing to have that conversation, but, uh, until they do listen at 94, I mean, they're the champs, so they ain't the champs no more. So. Got to roll with them. Have to. Let's see. George said, C-Dub, I just want you to know your show is so good that I'm pushing lunch just to watch. I like that. I'm I'm hungry uh, myself. That's going to be the next, next thing on my agenda here. Cody James says, you got any inside scoop on Holland? Yeah, we talked, we talked about him a little bit. Um, been quiet. But, you know, he hearing some things, I guess part of it's probably going to be, you know, uh, what are they what are they waiting for in terms of making a decision on that? Um, because Chris Beard's situation is still playing out. Like, I mean, personally, I think if, you know, the allegations are, are true or, or even close to holding weight, like he's, he's probably going to get fired. But. Uh, you know, do they wait until something comes to a head for that or, you know, do they go ahead and, and make a choice to either reaffirm their commitment or open it back up. And, I, you know, I, so from a timetable standpoint, it's just kind of hard to say, but definitely a lot to think about for them. Dustin Hoofman says, uh, what's it like walking in and facing Musselman for an interview? Um, well, it's actually been pretty solid this year because they've been winning so many games. <laughs> but... Um, you know, there, there are times where it can be a little bit nerve wracking. You know, he's an intense guy now. But what I will say about Muss is even when he's visibly upset or, or distraught, you know, after a game, uh, he's always been really good to the media. He did get a little frustrated last night, um, you know, as we kept digging in about Nick, which I, I don't blame him for that. But if you think about, you know, maybe early on um, in his tenure, like, you know, like his first year, uh, boy, he didn't handle those losses very well, <laughs> and uh, he didn't have a whole lot to say. But I, I got to say, uh, you know, in the three years I've been here since, um, you know, heck, I know when I lost the game as a coach, I didn't want to talk to anybody, and I, I didn't really have to because nobody cared. But people do care about this, and, uh, I mean, he's I think he's been really forthcoming with us. And, and the coolest thing, you know, with Muss is, is when you get the opportunities to – just chat with him off the record, you know, or, or away from a camera because um, he really has been good to us. I mean, he's a, he's a solid dude. He's funny. Uh, he's engaging, you know, and, and kind of what you see uh, on camera is, is, is what you get behind the scenes too. So he's really been a lot of fun to cover. Tim Eskew says, hey, Curtis, are you going to put NSJ in your projected starting lineup versus LSU like you did uh, versus UNC Asheville? Um, when the entire internet said he wasn't going to play, it's, it's 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 stuff like that that pisses me off. Like there's just no reason for <laughs> for for any comments like that. You know, um, who am I to contradict what Eric Musselman has said? Um, you know, we're trying to sneak some kind of report in by switching the starting lineup in a in a preview story. You know, there's no confirmation, no official release that he was going to be out, whether we knew it was going to happen or not. Um, and so I'll write my stories however I want. And if you don't like it, you don't have to read them. George Omer says, uh, C-Dub, what's the wiener's name? Slim Jim. Slim Jim is the wiener's name. Good dog, 11 years old. George says, C-Dub, why do you think Muss didn't make it as an NBA coach? Was it just lack of talent? on the roster that's just so hard you know it's so hard to say um 
situations. You know, a lot of time NBA head coaches, they don't have a lot of control over their rosters. You know, uh, they don't control free agent acquisitions or, or trades and things like that. So you, you're kind of, you know, dealt the cards that you are. That probably had some to do with it. And young, you know, with experience, you get better. I just think he's a great fit for the college game too. But I'm sure those experiences that he had in the pros kind of, you know, helped him. Z Beeler says, uh, Curtis, what's your favorite Razorback game ever? Ooh. Hmm. It would probably be a toss up for ones that I've covered um, between two last year. You know, the, the Auburn win at home was, I mean, it was just unbelievable, that atmosphere. Um, and, you know, the Gonzaga win in the Sweet 16. Those are those are probably be the two. You could flip a coin. I, I'd probably go with Auburn just because it was in Bud and you had the court storm. I mean, that was ridiculous. Let's see. Uh, Jonathan Parker says, what has happened to Dunning? He was freshman. He was a freshman off the bench in Europe. Now he hardly sees the floor. Hey, you know, everybody progresses at their own rate. And, um, you know, I, I think Dunning's, you know, probably a guy who was a little bit ahead at the time um, and, and did a good job. And, you know, maybe some other guys are, are starting to catch up there a little bit. Z. Biller says, with elite talent coming in the next two years, honestly, the teams coming up could be even better than this year. Yeah, well, I mean, I think the one thing you know, uh, you know, about an Eric Musselman coach team is they're going to have talent. Like, there's no question that they're going to have talent. Um, he, the man knows how to construct a roster, and whether it's, you know, with, with high school guys or portal guys, uh, you know, or, or a mixture, which is, is what you're most likely going to see. Uh, man, all the ingredients are going to be there for him to be really good. And, and yeah, that, I think the future future certainly looks bright. All right. Whew. We've done it. Wow. You guys carried the show today. I mean, awesome questions, ton of questions. You stepped up to the plate, knocked it out of the park. I got to give you credit. Yeah, I say it a lot, but I, I really do appreciate, you know, the interaction, the participation, uh, it makes this a lot of fun, and, and honestly, it means a lot to me um, that you value what I have to say and, and you tune in for the show. So, so really, thank you for that. Um, as I look out my window, it, it's getting nasty outside here in, in Fayetteville. So, you know, everybody stay safe out there. I hope you all enjoy the holidays, uh, the time with your family, your loved ones. Uh, it's been Curtis Wilkerson with, with Hogsports.com, and we'll talk to you soon.